Isn't it a great day to be a Christian? If you have your Bible, turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. And in the passage we're about to read, it talks about that we're justified by faith and not by works. So if doing good works doesn't justify us, then why do we do good works? And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. So Romans chapter 3, and let's start down in verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. I've shared this with some of you before about the uh, college class. It was a class that was studying uh, physics, and uh, one of the students made a presentation to the class about the law of the pendulum. And he talked about the law of the pendulum, that a pendulum, when it was set in motion, every swing was just a little bit less than the swing before. Uh, the idea is that the pendulum kept going back and forth until it reached equilibrium, where the force of gravity and the momentum of the pendulum came to an equal part, and then it stopped at the bottom. So he went through and he explained the law of gravity and the law of uh, momentum and the law of the pendulum, that every time it swung, it would be just a little bit short of where it started. And then he did a demonstration. He had a pendulum... It was a, a lead weight hung on a string up in front of the, the whiteboard. And he pulled it back and he made a mark where he turned it loose. And he let the pendulum go and it swung out and it came back. And when it stopped, he made another little mark where it stopped. And it swung back and forth and he made a mark. And every time it came back, he would mark it. And there was this series of marks. And the pendulum never went past one of those marks. It was always just a little bit short. And then he asked, does everybody believe in the law of the pendulum? And they all said, yeah, that was a good demonstration. We believe it. Uh, and the teacher raised his hand and said, yeah, I believe in the law of the pendulum. And he said, good. Now let's look at the rest of the demonstration. And there was a table setting up against the concrete wall over on the side of this classroom. And suspended from one of the rafters in the ceiling was a 250-pound metal weight on parachute cords. And it was strung there. And he asked the teacher to sit in that chair up against the concrete wall. And then he pulled that big weight right up about this far from his nose. And he said, do you believe in the law of the pendulum? And the teacher said, yes, I believe. And he turned the weights loose. And the weights swung out across the room, made a big arc. And then as it started back towards the professor's head, he moved. He got off the table. In fact, one of the members of the class later said, He'd never seen anybody move that fast in his whole life. He said, he dove out of that chair and got off the table. And the young man said, did he believe in the law of the pendulum? And the class said, no, he didn't believe it. Now on paper, it looked good. He knew that according to physics, that it wasn't going to hit him. But when he saw that metal coming at his head, that wasn't how he reacted. He said he believed, but he didn't really believe it. He believed he was going to get hit in the head. And so the question is, what does that have to do with us? Paul said that's really the same thing that's going on in chapter 3 about what we believe. 
Because when it comes to Christianity, we either believe that we're saved by faith or we believe that we're saved by doing good works. Uh, good works are good. I'm not discounting those, but does that have anything to do with our salvation? I mean, good works are good, but faith is better. Good works can't save us. We just read the scripture that said that good works can't make us righteous before God. Good works are not going to make God love us more. And not doing them won't make him love us less. Romans 3.20 said, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. In other words, nobody's going to be saved by the works that we do. It's not going to make any difference. Titus 3.5 says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Well, that seems to go against all common sense. I mean, godly people should do godly things, right? I mean, that's we're here. We're holy. We're supposed to be different. Uh, if we're Christians and we're not doing good things, that kind of makes us hypocrites, doesn't it? And inherently, people believe that God wants us to do good things. Uh, and the more good things we do, the more righteous things we do, the better God's going to like us. And so we should be more justified when we do good than when we don't. And that's what all the religions of the world teach. Uh, doesn't matter what it is. Uh, if you believe in Islam, you believe that the good things here will give you extra rewards in heaven. If you are Buddhist, you believe that to reach Nirvana, you've got to do good things. And unfortunately, there are a lot of Christians that believe that. They think the holier you are, the more just you're going to be. But the Bible says that's not how it works. Uh, the original text we read, a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Well, how does that work? I read about a man that was doing prison ministry. He'd go into the jail, he'd talk to the convicts, and he told them that they're not saved by their good works. And that was confusing to people in prison because uh, they knew that they were in prison because they'd been doing bad works. Uh, and they'd been taught that to get out of prison, they needed to start doing good works. And if they're going to not go back to prison when they get out, they got to keep on doing good works. And so they figured that they were justified by their good works, and it confused them. So he told them the parable of the chocolate milk. Uh, he said, I like chocolate milk. He said, every night before I go to bed, I get a big glass of milk, and I put some of that cocoa powder in it, uh, and stir it up, and make a nice cold glass of chocolate milk, and, and I drink it, and it's good. He said, now let's say that I set my glass on the counter and don't rinse it out that night. Next day, you come over to my house, and we're outside, and we're hot and sweaty, and we're out doing work and whatever. I said, would you like some lemonade? I've got a fresh pitcher of lemonade in the refrigerator. He said, well, yeah, I'd like some lemonade. So he said, well, come on in. Let me pour you some lemonade. He opens the refrigerator, and there's this big, cold pitcher of lemonade. It's just been made that day, just been in the refrigerator long enough to be ice cold, and he gets it out, and then he reaches on the counter, and he gets that glass with the dried chocolate milk stuck on the edge. I don't know if you've ever done that before, but if you do, that stuff kind of peels and curdles and makes a mess. If you pour that lemonade into that glass, all that stuff's going to start floating onto the top. And somebody hands it to you, are you going to drink it? No, because if you drink something like that, it'd probably make you sick at your stomach. And he said, that's the parable of the lemonade. That's how God sees our good works. There's nothing wrong with the good works. Those are good. They're fresh. They're good. Just like that lemonade was fresh and good and pure. It's what you put it in that matters because it doesn't matter how good our works are if we're not clean on the inside. If our good works are coming out of a corrupt vessel, a corrupt container, then it's not going to please God. So before our good works are going to do any good, we've got to make sure that we cleanse ourselves. So the question is, how do we cleanse ourselves? And we talked about that last week. We can't. There's nothing we can do to cleanse ourselves because God did that already. He sent Jesus. Jesus sacrificed himself for our salvation. Jesus paid the price. All we've got to do is accept his gift. Uh, if we are to study the Bible, the most common uh, means of salvation, how are we saved? It's by grace. Faith is the second closest or the second most often repeated. And it's important because it's got to come first. If you don't believe the Bible, then you're not going to do anything. Or you're not going to do all the rest of the steps. Over and over it says 
that we're saved by grace. Ephesians 2, 8, for the grace you're saved through faith, that not of yourself is the gift of God. Mark 16, 16, he that believeth is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. Uh, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should be saved. You've got to believe to be saved. Uh, and Romans 3, 26, that we just read a little while ago, I say at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. We've got to have faith. We can't be saved without faith. Faith is an essential requirement uh, for salvation. Well, if all I've got to have is faith in Jesus, then why should I do any good works? Uh, I mean, if Jesus is going to save me, is that good enough? Do I just sit around? I'm not going to get any brownie points. It's not going to make me more justified to do good things. So why do I good, do good things? Paul kind of said that in Romans 6, 1, when he says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace might abound? I've already been saved, so why do I need to do good things? I can do evil things. I'm going to be saved anyway. Well, that's not how that works either. According to a Gallup poll, 80% of Americans believe that God exists. Now, this is an old Gallup poll. It's about 10 years ago. 80% say they believe that Jesus rose from the grave. 80% believe that Jesus rose from the grave. Does that mean that 80% of the people in this country have been forgiven of their sins just because they believe in Jesus? Intellectually, they bought into the gospel message. They said, okay, I believe that. Does that save me from my sins? Well, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, John 14, 15. Now, keeping the commandments won't make me righteous. Keeping the commandments won't make me justified, but we don't do it for that. We do it because we love Jesus. Saw this illustration. kind of explains that. Let's say we're going from here to Memphis and we get on I-40. What's the speed limit on I-40? 70 miles an hour. If you get on I-40 and you're doing 70 miles an hour, how many people are going to pass you? Just about everybody. I don't want to accuse anybody, but I'd be willing to, to bet if you were behind me on I-40, you'd go past me if I'm doing 70 miles an hour. Some of you, some of you probably would. Uh, do you believe that the speed limit is 70 miles an hour? But do you live like you believe that the speed limit is 70 miles an hour? Is that how we're going about our daily life? Now let's say, so people don't do 70 because that's what the law says. But let's say we've got somebody in the car with us that doesn't feel comfortable going past 70 miles an hour. You know they don't feel comfortable going past 70 miles an hour. You love that person. Uh, would you probably come closer to, to doing 70 miles an hour because you care about them? Okay, that's what this is saying. We don't do it because that's what the law says. We do it because that's what Jesus wants. And we love Jesus. So we want to keep his commandments. We want to do the things that he want us, wants us to do. So if we love Jesus, we'll be in church. If we love Jesus, we'll study our Bible. And we'll pray. Not because the Bible, we've got to do that. That's what the law says. That's what the rules are. We want to do that because we love Jesus. We're not going to do some of the things that we're used to doing, not because they're in violation of the law, but because Jesus died for us. He saved us, and we love him. And we want to live lives that show that we love him. So the question is, the title of the lesson is, what does it mean to believe? There are a lot of churches that make that really complicated. I've seen places that have this big doctrine of faith and a big list of questions. You have to have it right uh, to make sure that you follow all their rules and everything. Uh, I saw a story about uh, Walter Chrysler. Walter Chrysler is a man that Chrysler Motors is named after. He was the chairman. They said the first car that he ever bought, he took it out into his garage and took it apart. He laid all the parts out on paper and traced them. <coughs> And then he put it back together because he wanted to know exactly how it worked. I don't know about you. I don't do that. When I buy a new car, I put the key in the ignition and turn it on. If it runs, great. If it doesn't run, two things. Is the battery charged? And is there gas in the tank? Those are the limits of my knowledge of how a car works. If both those things are there, it's still not running. It's somebody else's problem. i got to take it to a mechanic. I don't have to know everything about it in order to use a car. 
You don't have to know everything about the Bible in order to be a Christian. Go back to the day of Pentecost. Peter preached the first gospel sermon. Don't know everything he said. We do know what part was recorded. Uh, 3,000 people heard that lesson, believed him, and were baptized that day. It probably took them longer to baptize those 3,000 people than the sermon lasted. Okay? He didn't possibly tell them everything there was to know about Jesus. He didn't tell them everything there was to know about living a Christian life, but they knew enough that they repented and they were baptized. And that's the same way that we're saved today. Peter told the people of what we read in Acts 2, that Jesus came down from heaven to die from our sins, for our sins, that he died, that he was buried, that he rose from the grave, and that the only way we're going to be acceptable to God is for us to believe in him, to repent of our sins, and to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Uh, and throughout the book of Acts, the message is always the same. Jesus died for your sins. You need to believe in him. Do what he wants you to do. There was a woman named Lydia that uh, heard the Bible story beside the river. She was baptized in Acts 16, 14, and 15. The Ethiopian eunuch that was on his way back to Ethiopia from Jerusalem, and Philip joined his charity, and he started teaching him about Jesus. He didn't tell him everything there was to know about Jesus. He didn't have time in that little trip in the chariot. But he told him enough that the eunuch said, there's water, I need to be baptized. And he did that, uh, Acts 8.36, Acts 16, what we've studied in a Wednesday night class not long ago. Paul and Silas were arrested for casting the evil spirit out of the slave girl. Put him in the jail in Philippi, the Philippian jailer was there. They prayed, they sang songs, there was an earthquake. The jailer was about to kill himself because he thought all the prisoners had escaped. Paul said, we're all still here. And then he talked to him about Jesus. And that night, he and his whole household were baptized. Over and over, the story is the same. Every time, it didn't take people long to make up their minds. They didn't have to know everything to happen. They needed to know that Jesus was the Son of God, that he died for their sins, and they needed to do what he wanted them to do. So the question this morning is, what do you believe? Uh, has your faith made a difference in the way you live your life? Are we any different from other people they say, I believe in Jesus from 80% of the population of the country that believe in Jesus. Has it made a difference? Has your faith caused you to accept what Jesus said you need to do? What Jesus said you need to be. You need to be a Christian. It's the only life worth living, the only death one would dare to die. And the way to become a Christian this morning is the same way that people became Christians on the day of Pentecost. You've got to have faith. You've got to believe. But again, the title of the lesson is, what does it mean to believe? Go back to the illustration. Did that professor really believe in the law of the pendulum? He said he did. He said, I believe in that. But he didn't act that way. Are you acting like you believe? Believing in Christ is more than just saying, I believe. Nowhere in Scripture do we find anybody saying, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and whoever's talking to him said, okay, you're forgiven. If you believe it, you've got to act like you believe it. You've got to live out the way that shows that you believe it. That means you need to repent of your sins. Confess that Jesus is the Lord of your life, and letting your sins be washed away in the waters of baptism. If you need to do that this morning, won't you come right now? We stand together as we sing.